Ken Allen tells us of an unusual problem he had as a motorman on the subway. When I left the streetcars, the first thing that entered my head was no more flat wheels. Now, for you people that don't know what a flat wheel is, when you brake suddenly on a greasy rail, instead of the wheel spinning, it kind of sets itself, and instead of spinning, it slides on the rail, which causes one part of the wheel to go flat. That is a flat wheel. Now, going to the subway, I thought, well, those days are over. But lo and behold, they weren't over, because with open cuts and then the tunnel, you would come down an open cut, like to Rosedale, all wet and everything, and then you would go into the tunnel at Bloor, put on your brakes at full, and you'd get a flat wheel because that wet would still be on and it would slide. So we did have as many flat wheels uh, on the subway as we did on the streetcars, and these flat wheels, believe me, are very expensive. The whole wheel has to be reground, and it's a very expensive job. On April 4, 1954, a group of rail fans chartered motor 2932 and trailer 2783, the last trailer train in Canada, to commemorate the end of 33 years of service on Young. They took it along Front Street, across Spadina to Bathurst. The Bathurst trippers, which had used this track for 20 years, were also discontinued when the subway opened. For a time in the early 1950s, the TTC had considered rebuilding these whip motors for use on other lines. But when second-hand American PCCs became available, the idea was forgotten. Modern PCC cars had run a night service on Young from 1940 to the end of operation, but few photos of them exist, except for this daytime fan trip. In this film clip, PCC 4597, an ex-Cincinnati second-hand car, circles the Glen Echo Loop. After 30 years of faithful service on the Young Surface Line, Whit Car 2528 had a new lease on life in the subway as RT4, the refuse collection car. Its trolley pole was replaced with third rail shoes, and it became the only double-ended Whit Car to ever run in Toronto. After its tenure as the garbage car, it became a general maintenance vehicle. For a short time, it shunted the new subway cars as they were being delivered. It was later scrapped in the 1970s. RT5 was an ex-Toronto Civic Railway car that was one of the first single-truck city cars purchased in 1915. For years, it was the subway's only rail grinding car. The initial order from Gloucester was 104 cars. These cars were extremely heavy, 40% overweight. When this was realized in 1953, Gloucester, in conjunction with a an organization known as the Aluminum Development or Association in England offered the TEC four cars out of the order to be built with aluminum sides and aluminum roofs. They offered them a very attractive price, a very minimal increase over the steel car price to see if the weight reduction would be attractive to the TTC. So the last four cars on the original order 5100 to 5103 were the aluminum cars with a substantial reduction in weight, some six tons in weight difference. However, the TTC intended in the rush hours to operate six car trains and to really evaluate the economies of an aluminum train set, it was necessary to have another two cars which the TTC agreed to purchase, having furnished the electrical and mechanical equipment from the spare parts order and Gloucester building two more car bodies. These aluminum cars were very successful. They pointed the way to weight reduction, energy consumption reduction, that was very important to the TTC but they continued to be evaluated for some years. In the meantime, the traffic on the Young Street line was growing at such a rate that it was apparent they should go to the full eight-car train capacity as soon as possible, and another order for 34 cars was then placed in 1955. However, since these cars were in, in essence makeup cars just to be added to the existing fleet. It was decided they could economize 
by providing them with simply cabs for the guard and no driving controls. The cars were called non-driving motor cars. They were fully motorized, but you could not drive from them. They were then marshaled in between pairs of the original class of cars so that effectively they formed a fixed four-car set. Davisville Station was located adjacent to the subway yards where cars were stored and maintained. New vehicles were delivered here via the now abandoned Beltline Railway. Ray Corley describes the new additions to the subway fleet. In 1960, work was underway on the extension of the Young Subway up University Avenue to Bloor. A very short extension, but the forerunner of a major extension of the system. And so additional cars were required. Much of the Gloucester car technology was then applied to the thinking of TTC and the new car design. Remember, Gloucester had come forward with the concept of a longer car. TTC decided that the car could, in fact, be even longer, and 75 feet was established as the maximum car length that could be accommodate reasonably within the clearances of the tunnel and the curvature of the different parts of the line. Second, that aluminum obviously was the way to go. The aluminum cars didn't need any paint or any particular upkeep. They were certainly lighter. The, T uh, the commission could now see a car that could come in at less than 1,000 pounds per foot of length. The longer car meant less car units, less maintenance on equipment. And so a specification was written with the help of the suppliers around the 75 foot aluminum car and at the same time, the Canadian Car and Foundry Company was developing this design. They were also promoting it as the car of the future, the RTC car in different lengths. They had a, a 52 and a 72 and a 75 foot length RTC for rapid transit car. And so when the order was finally placed for the new cars, it turned out that this was the design of the future. However, Canadian Car, while they had done much of the preliminary work, lost out to Montreal Locomotive Works, and the 36 cars required for the subway extension up University were therefore dubbed the M1 cars, M for Montreal Locomotive Works. Uh, they had uh, a new, completely new package from General Electric, uh, the SCM control, which had electrodynamic braking, they had a new electro-pneumatic brake system from West Code of England, which was a development of the Gloucester car. So the new car design benefited from the lessons over the years from the fleet of Gloucester cars. If they hadn't had the Gloucester cars, if they hadn't performed so well, uh, so reliably, and proven some of the things that pointed to the future, the 75-foot aluminum car, the longest and lightest car in the world when it was developed by the Commission, uh, would never have come to be into being. The only casualties when the subway extensions were open were abandoned car lines and the Peter Witt streetcar. While a few large wits remained on the property, small wits continued to be used in rush hours. When the DuPont car line was abandoned in 1963, the remaining small wits were disposed of. Cars 2894 and 2766 and large wit 2424 survived and were reactivated in 1974 for tour tram service. Electric service on Young Street north of Eglinton was now provided by Canadian Car Brill trolley buses, acquired new in 1953. These buses were larger than the ones on the Nortown route, which ran out of the Eglinton division. The Eglinton station became the destination of an expanded feeder bus network from the suburbs. Bus bays connected directly with the subway concourse below. Driving a trolley bus has its ups and downs. Ken Allen tells of his ups. After being on the subway for a short time at the beginning, 
I went on a trolley and took my trolley coach train and I used to operate on the Young Street line and one day a very funny incident. If a pole came off we would pull the rope at the back, pull it down under the little catch that was on top of the roof and then pull the rest of the pole, uh, the rest of the rope out from around the winder to break it up. Now, if a rope broke, you had to climb up the trolley and pull the pole down and do it that way and then tie a knot in the rope. And this day my rope broke, entering the subway at Eglinton. So I climbed on the roof, got a hold of the pole, slipped, the pole went straight out at the side of the trolley and I'm standing up there, hanging up there I should say, with my feet down and the inspector looking up and talking to me and his Irish brogan saying, Hey, you've got a little problem up there now, haven't you? And this was funny, the passengers were looking. I said, for goodness sake, push me back. After a little while of holding up the other trolleys, they did push me back onto the roof and I got down. The northern terminus for the young trolley bus line was the Glen Echo Loop. On March 31st, 1973, the young subway extension to York Mills was opened. Trolley coach service was discontinued and a few weeks later the overhead was removed ending 80 years of surface electric service on Young Street. Today, the Loop is a supermarket parking lot and a residential complex. The downtown bus serves as a weekday shopper's bus for seniors unable to climb the subway stairs. It ran on Lower Young from Front Street, first to Wellesley Station, and then to Rosedale Station. It was later extended to St. Clair Station. In 1990, the downtown route was discontinued. Through service is now provided on Young between Steeles Avenue and downtown, the first unified surface transit link in Young Street history. When one is young, there's a tendency to think that things are going to last forever. The G-Class cars spent over 38 years on Toronto's subway system, but nothing lasts forever. The Gloucester cars had put in their service moving Metro Toronto's commuters. On a dreary September's day, the Toronto Transportation Society chartered a red Gloucester train for a farewell trip. Included in this eight-car train were the first two cars, 5098 and 5099, that took the first official trip down the line in 1954. For the subway passengers who rode them regularly, there was no love lost when they were replaced by new air-conditioned cars. But there is a certain sadness when an era ends, and it was in this atmosphere that your narrator and about 70 die-hard fans of the G trains took the six-hour subway trip. I actually got off the train and chased it in my car, if you can imagine it. I got off at the Young Station, chased the train to Kipling, back to Keele, and then caught the final pull-in at Davisville. In all, 50 miles were covered for this five-minute clip. The lower Bay Station was closed to regular service in 1963. Now this station is occasionally leased to film companies who stage action scenes for Hollywood movies. The only subway trains that pass through here now are the out-of-service ones and maintenance vehicles. The only time the G-trains went through the Young Station on the Bloor Danforth line in regular service was briefly in the 1960s when the three subways had a six-month combined service. When the Bloor Danforth line was extended to Warden in the east and Islington in the west, the G trains did make it out there. But when further extensions to Kennedy and Kipling were opened, it was rare to see a Gloucester train on this line. The G cars were not a problem free vehicle. These heavy cars were stopped by air brakes. Brake shoes would clasp the wheels, bringing the vehicle to a stop. But in doing so, considerable amounts of metallic brake dust would be given off in the tunnels. While various methods of dealing with this dilemma were attempted, the problem plagued the cars for their entire life. There was some hope that the cars would provide some use for other cities with their rapid transit plans, but such was not the case. Ray Corley reflects on the G-Cars last days. The G-Cars, despite the problems of overweight and the brake shoe dust, were nevertheless one of the most reliable investments the TTC ever made. Uh, they lasted almost 40 years. The, they continued to operate reliably even up to the latter days when parts were becoming hard to find. They were not modern as viewed by the present generation. 
Uh, after all, after 40 years, even an automobile of uh, yesteryear begins to look a little bit outmoded. But when they reach the end of their life, within the last two years, uh, they eventually were cut up for scrap. Not all of them, the six aluminum cars, that experimental batch back in 1954, uh, were converted into work or service cars for various duties which go on during the most, in the most cases, during the middle of the night. And another pair of cars was also converted, one of the red cars, a uh, pair of the red cars. So eight of the cars are still operating, although people don't see them very often, and they're painted with yellow stripes. They, the red cars incidentally were painted silver and then put the yellow stripe on them so they looked the same as the aluminum cars. And four other cars are still held in storage by TDC for possible conversion to work cars. If that doesn't happen, they'll be scrapped. But the two cars that were at the head end of the train that opened the service on March the 30th, 1954, were donated by TDC to the Ontario Electric Railway Historical Association at Rockwood and they were moved out by rail and road transport to that site and they can still be seen today the only pair of cars still in their original guise looking very much the same as they were delivered almost 40 years ago. The Halton County Radio Railway Museum at Rockwood, Ontario is home to a number of streetcars and work equipment that serve Toronto streets. The museum is the home of the last of Toronto's large wits, which retired from regular service in 1961. 2424 was chartered for a trip around the city in that year, and shortly after it was decommissioned, found a new home at Rockwood. For a while, it was loaned to the TTC as one of the tour trams. In 1988, after 13 years of service in that role, it was retired and returned to the museum with a fresh coat of paint. September 1992 marks more than 100 years of electric transportation on Yonge Street. The original subway ran 4.2 miles and had 12 stations. Today's subway system has 61 stations and is over 40 miles in length. New subway extensions have pushed retail and commercial development into what once were bedroom communities and created millions of dollars of new development and commerce. Plans are in the works for a $1 billion extension loop up Young to Steeles, Metro's northern boundary, to link with the Spadina subway. And so it's with fond memories of the past that I leave you with another promise of the future. Proposals exist to redevelop this land as a residential commercial complex. This 17-acre site is the largest underdeveloped parcel of land in Midtown Toronto. The historic North Toronto Station is the centerpiece of this proposal. It is to be rehabilitated to its past glory and will serve as a GO Transit commuter rail station with direct access to the Young Subway's Summer Hill Station. If these proposals are approved and the North Toronto Station is once again alive with activity, we won't forget the role the Young Streetcars and the Young Subway had in bringing these abandoned platforms back to life.